webinar. I'm Michael Wisdom from Bristol University, Bristol Cops Institute, and I'm going to introduce the seminar. At Bristol Cops Institute, we're very keen on collaboration between academia and industry, and so one of the things we want to achieve with these seminars is to bring together top speakers who will give research and applications perspective on some of the key topics which are facing composites. So the topic of this afternoon's seminar is automated manufacture. And we have uh, some two excellent speakers who I'll introduce in a minute. Just a few housekeeping arrangements. If you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A at any time, and then there will be time for answering questions after the talks. But please put them in the Q&A uh, while, while they're fresh in your mind, if you have questions that you'd like to ask the speakers, and then uh, I will put them to the speakers. We are recording this session and the video and the slides will be available online by the website. So um, if our speakers would like to put their cameras on so I can introduce them. Yes, thank you very much. So we're delighted to have um, Enrique Garcia from the National Composite Center. He's the chief technology officer there. And he's played a key role over a number of years in developing the National Composite Center and working on the strategy and uh, still seeing the, the technology development and the growth of the National Composite Center, which has really grown a lot over the last few years. So we're very fortunate to have him with us. And he's uh, got a, M a PhD from MIT and is also a visiting industrial fellow here at the University of Bristol and has got a, a long track record working in industry before coming to the National Composite Center. And then we have Professor Song Van Hoa, who is professor in the Department of Mechanical, Industrial and Aerospace Engineering at Concordia University. He's had a, a long and distinguished career uh, and in recent years been working particularly on automation of composites, but worked on many other topics over the years in composites. He's had many, uh, many honors and awards and is a fellow of, of uh, many learned societies, including the uh, Canadian Academy of Engineering. So we've got two really good speakers for you this afternoon. And so I would like to, uh, to start by asking Professor Song Van Hoa to share his screen and give us his perspective on automated composites manufacture. So over to you, Song, if you'd like to share your screen. Okay, thank you. Yes, well, good day, everybody. I don't know whether it's morning or afternoon around the world. And uh, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Michael Wisdom uh, for having invited me to uh, be here to share with you uh, some of the uh, work that we have been doing on the automated composite manufacturing. So the, uh, my presentation will consist uh, basically five items. The first, uh, uh, the conclusion from the uh, fifth international symposium on automated composite manufacturing. Then I will present the uh, work, uh, the recent advances on the uh, automated composite uh, manufacturing for thermoset metric composite and thermoplastic metric composites. And then I will take a minute or two just to introduce a new topic that we have started recently that is on 4D printing of composites. And finally, there will be the future outlook. So I wish to mention that um, I have given a similar kind of a talk uh, online and also in person. Uh, at the uh, fifth international symposium on automotive composite manufacturing, one in April 2021, and another one in person at the National Composite Center last year in April 2022. So the conclusion from uh, my presentation at that time is summarized here. Uh, one on thermoset matrix composite, that what I have mentioned here, that the thermoset matrix composites have been successfully used in making aircraft structures. And the improvement that can be made will be on the speed of deposition, the inspection technique uh, for to, to detect the defects, the understanding of the wrinkles, and also understanding the performance of structures containing uh, lap and gaps. In the case of thermoplastic uh, composite, the issue involved here would be the low interlaminar shear strength that we have for laminate made by AFB, and also the distortion of structures with free edges. And the future outlook at that time is uh, to expand the technique maybe to go to more commercial products or maybe smaller, smaller product with more complex geometry. Maybe go to smaller AV machines and also 3D printers with continuous, continuous fibers. 
So over the last few years, I would like to present in the subsequent my presentation here concerning some of the recent uh, advance of the work that have been done on this topic. So first, uh, the topic of thermosegmetric composites. So the items that I feel that are important, these are the uh, in inspection to de detect the defects, the understanding of the fiber steering and wrinkles, and also recently, there has been uh, some work on the processing using automatic fiber placement using thin plies. So I will go over each of these items uh, one by one. So the case of the uh, defects. Uh, now, the, the fact that in the automotive uh, composite manufacturing, uh, people are laying down narrow uh, piece of tape. Now, the fact that you have narrow piece of tape, that means you need to use a lot of them. You have a lot of these kind of narrow tapes. And when you have many of these tapes, then you tend to have a problem issue with the uh, arrangement or alignment between these things. So there is an issue in terms of lap and gaps that may appear in these, uh, in these kind of structure. And also the fact you have to make a lot of cut in each of these individual toes and things like this. So you have also the, the issue of uh, trying to align or make sure these kind of boundary are, are aligned or, or also between, uh, between kind of the geometry that are maybe creating some kind of issues. And also the other aspect also is that the, the need to assure that the tape will kind of lay on top of the surface of the mold. And if the tape doesn't lay on top of the surface of the mold, then you tend to have some problem like bridging, for example. So there are many issues here, besides the fact that you also sometimes you have also the foreign object debris. So in 20, 2020, the people at the University of South Carolina, they made a good job in terms of identifying many of these kind of defects inside the thermosegmetric composite, and they identify 14 different kinds of defects that may occur there. They also identify five different perspectives in terms of the defects. The first perspective is anticipation. That means that this one here you predict you can, during the design stage, you may be able to feel that maybe you can find that there may be some defects at a certain location. That depends on the geometry of the surface and also the, the direction of the path. The second perspective is existence. That means that in, that is due to inspection. That means when you are laying down, the different uh, toes, uh, then you may be able to find uh, in the reality that may exist some of the defects. The third perspective is significance. That means whether these defects are critical or not critical. What is the effect on the performance? Whether you can reject a part or maybe you can live with that. And the fourth one is progression. That means whether the presence of this defect can create other defects during operation. And finally is the disposition. That means you need to make a decision what to do with the defects. Whether you say, will you reject the part, you repair it, or maybe you live with that. So that means in the, in the sense here, that means you have the, um, the one important aspect is the defect detection. You know, people spend a good amount of time trying to detect the defect to make sure that you have good quality laminates. Now in the past, uh, the detection was done by using uh, camera, using a manual, but the manual is very inefficient way of trying to detect the defect. It consumes a lot of time and resources and it defeats the purpose of doing automated composite manufacturing. So there has been a lot of effort trying to automate this kind of uh, uh, defect detection. So basically the system that people use to detect the defect inside the composite is some kind of a, a profilometer in the sense that you have the profilometer, whether you use a laser line or can use some kind of optical system to, uh, to scan the surface of the composite, the surface, and try to de defect, detect some kind of deviation from the norm. So this case here, that means that you, you need to be able to detect these kind of defects. Now, the next aspect of this system is that you need to have a good software program, a suitable pro program, many programs to be able to handle the, the data that you obtain from the, uh, from the detection. And so the amount of data consumed can be a large amount of data. It is estimated that they can be approaching one terabyte per part, per for complex part. So that means there is a good amount of effort trying to invest in some kind of computer system to do that. And the other aspect also is that you need to have some kind of a statistical analysis and control to make decision on how to use the inspection data. So that means that you have to use this kind of a statistical analysis to see whether the defect is severe, is the defect is critical, or if the defect is, is okay, that means you can accept that or you repair. So that means it shows that there is a good amount of resources uh, and they, that need to be spent in terms of these uh, de defect detection. And also uh, you need to train the personnel so that you can have good people that can really administer, run these programs and also make decisions. 
So in this case here, then uh, recently there has been some work done in terms of trying to integrate uh, the defect detection and the analysis. So there was a publication this year uh, from the people in uh, Zhejiang University in China. And what they do is that they first, they scan the surface. They uh, scan the surface of the structure. Then they get all the many the scan points and they distribute them into different kinds of layers. And then from these layer, they put them into a finite element program, you know, a finite element model. So this case here, many of these, each of the layer may have some kind of defects. And they were trying to run analysis subject to some kind of loading to see the performance of, uh, of the structure. So this case here, they want to integrate the defect detection and analysis to see the effect of the defects on the performance using the modeling rather than using the real experimental data. There's another approach taken by the researcher at the University of Bristol, again, the, uh, the publication this year, 2023, and the concept here is uh, to say the inspect thing and react. That means that first you do inspection. I mean, right here you have, you have some kind of a door coming in, you use a camera to, the, uh, to detect the, uh, the surface, whatever the defect that you may have. And then after that here, that means that you suppose that you have, uh, you come up and you know that you have a certain layer that laid down and that layer has a certain kind of defect. Then you can make the, the decision what to do and try to try to minimize the effect of the defect by modifying the process parameters. I mean, you can change the temperature, the speed of the operation, or the pressure. So that way, then in the second layer that you in the second layer that go down here, you can you can uh, try to kind of minimize the effect of the defect. So that is another way in terms of integrating the information from the inspection and try to do something about it. Now, the other thing here that uh, I feel that a lot of people spend time trying to do here is the case of wrinkles. Now, wrinkle is another form of defect, but the wrinkle is, uh, is caused by the steering. Now, we know that the case of the automotive fiber placement, it has the ability to steer the fiber along a certain curve, uh, curve path. And the reason why people do that is so that you can kind of position the fiber in the direction of the load. And that way, then you have more load efficient uh, kind of design, and maybe you can have a lighter structure. But when you are doing the steering aspect here, then you you, you make the, uh, you, uh, you create the situation where one edge of the, uh, the tape is shorter than the other edge. And the, the fact that this is shorter, it tends to create wrinkles and then it's buckling. In the center you have, you create, you put compression load here and you have the, you have the wrinkles. Now there was some work by, uh, done uh, in 2015 and they mentioned that the presence of these fiber wrinkles in the CFRB may cause the, the loss in tensile strength of between 36 to 40%. Now this case is very critical. I mean, there's, a lot, there's a lot of loss. So that I means that people are trying to really to reduce the wrinkle and try to understand the wrinkles and many things, many work that have been done. So uh, over the last uh, many years, I have been some work done in terms of trying to model, create some kind of a model to explain the creation of the wrinkle. In the sense that people use a mechanics model and explain that using the buckling aspect and things like this. And there are many uh, parameters such as the, the tackiness of the tape, the temperature, the pressure, etc. But there was some work done again at the University of South Carolina that what they did is that they were doing some kind of a geometrical analysis. And by doing this geometric analysis, they are trying to predict ahead of time during the design phase where the wrinkle will form or not. So this has the kind of predict, prediction capability. So the way they do that is that they use, like I say, geometrical modeling. In the sense, you take a look into a surface. You are given some kind of a surface and they're given by an equation of the surface like S as a function of UV. And also you have a, a, a certain path, so a certain kind of a path that you lay down of the fiber. So this case, you take a look into the one edge. You take a look into one edge of the, of the toe and you have this kind of a particular path that you divide it into many points, maybe you equally distribute that point along this path here. Then after that, then you are trying to find the other edge. You're trying to find the other edge using the mathematical modeling. It is saying that you follow all of these lines, you follow the geodesic line. That means you follow the, the equation of the surface along the geodesic. And that way then you can determine the position of the correspond points for the other edge. So you can find the, uh, you can find the second edge of the tape. And then from there, you can calculate to see what is the length of this particular second edge. And you compare the length of the second edge to the length of the first edge. If the length of the second edge is less than the length of the first edge, then wrinkle will appear on the second edge. 
But if the length of the second edge is longer, that the first edge, that ribbon may appear on the first edge. So basically, that is using geometric modeling. They can predict to see whether you have some kind of wrinkle that may occur due to the mismatch between the actual path of the toe and also the surface of the of the, uh, of the that you can do. So by using this uh, method, they were able to generate um, some kind of a, uh, the uh, the picture to show whether there's a, whether there will, whether there will be wrinkle that is forming or not. So this picture, uh, the green line, shows the place where you don't have any wrinkle, and also the yellow. Uh, location uh, show the player location was wrinkle to occur. And they can do that for the layer to zero degree, 90 degree, 45 degrees, and minus 45 degrees. And you can see that for the same kind of surface geometry, seen some location along the zero degree, uh, for the zero degree layer, you don't have any wrinkle. Whereas you have at the 45 degree, you may have wrinkles. So this um, capacity, so this idea seem to be interesting in the sense that it can plan, it can help in the plan process parameters in the design stage, in the early stage, and to see whether you may have a wrinkle that occur or not. And if you know that, then you can control your process parameters, trying to minimize the effect of the wrinkle and so on. Now, the other thing, uh, some work, work that is done recently is the case of the thin ply composite. Uh, the thin ply composite, these are the uh, thin ply have been around for a number of years. And these are the plies that have thickness less than 100 micron compared to the standard ply of 0 0.125 uh, micron. And it is known that these plies here have the better resistance to dynamic tolerance under applied stress when applied to standard ply laminates. And they have the capability to suppress and delay micro cracks. But the, the question is whether these, because of the fact that these plies are very thin, whether we can process them using the automated trouble placement because of the fact that you have to feed the toe into some kind of a very narrow slit in the machine. So there was some work done at the University of Delaware and this publication this year. And they mentioned that they have did that. They were, they were, they were using the team ply laminate from IM7852. And they were using uh, two different techniques to make the laminate. The first technique is use hand layup to use a kind of white tape. And the second technique using AFP. So this case here, they were slitting the tape into narrow, narrow tape and they were laying down using the automotive for replacement. So the, uh, the good news is that what they found is that they were after they make the laminates and they were testing that for different properties, such as the tensile properties and also the open hole tensile, uh, tensile the trend and so on. And basically they found that there is no difference between the two. So in the sense here, what it says here that, you know, people can uh, process thin ply laminate and have equivalent kind of properties with the one with a hand layup, which is I think good news for the uh, automotive for replacement. Now I move to the next topic here on thermoplastic composite in the case of processing using automated for replacement. So the issue that I find here will be the determination of temperature distribution in the laminate. The second one is how to improve in the laminar strength. And the third is how to eliminate the distortion of structures with free edges. So these are the issues I feel that are, that are important for the case of AFP using thermoplastics. So this case here, the important the temperature distribution, but I find in the case of thermoplastic uh, processing is that it's very important to have the bonding between the layer. The layer need to be melted and bonded. If the temperature is not high enough, then the bonding may not be good. The second one is that also you have temperature gradient. The fact that you have heating and cooling during the process, there may be temperature gradient and this can create residual stress development. And the residual stress development create distortion of the structure. So that is, we need uh, everything really dependent on the temperature distribution. And for this case here, then, it, it, uh, then many people have really kind of spent the effort trying to uh, try to determine the temperature distribution inside the laminate. And there are two aspects. One is measurement. You know, how to measure the temperature in the laminate. The second one is analysis. In the case of measurement, now this case is suppose that you uh, use people use something like infrared camera in, a, in order to uh, detect the temperature at the, at the surface. But the fact that you have the, um, the roller and the roller has some kind of a boundary here, in this case, it seemed to interfere, obstruct the line of light of the, uh, uh, of the, of the camera. So that means the, the camera cannot reach, reach the location of the nip point. So, from the, from that, from, so, so that means in that case here, the people cannot measure the temperature at the nip point. We can only measure temperature around that, but not at the nip point. 
But the Nippon is very critical for the case of understanding and bonding for the thermoplastic composite. So that is from the measurement side. From the analysis side, in this case, yeah, I refer to the case where you are using hot guys stock. When people use hot guys stock, then you have some kind of heat input from the hot guys. In this case here, then people do the heat transfer analysis. And for in order to get the input from the, uh, from the hot guys stock, they use the convective coefficient, the H value, or the convective coefficient. And normally people assume this to be a constant. And also, the, even for the constant value, there is a lot of difference between one researcher to the next. And the variation can be sometimes can be 100 times different. So there is a lot of inconsistency in terms of the value that people assume. And besides that, also, this is not a constant. It varies from, from location to location. So a few years ago, we took the effort of trying to do the analysis and take into account the variable heat transfer coefficient. And in this case here, that we were comparing the analysis at the three different points inside the laminate at this point in layer eight, later 10, and also the, at the top surface. And this one here shows you one example between the analysis for the case you have the constant, you have the constant heat transfer coefficient and you have the variable transfer coefficient compared to the experimental results. You can see that you, if you use a constant uh, heat transfer coefficient, there is a big difference between that and the experimental result. Where you use a variable heat transfer coefficient, you have better agreement. And this one here is shown for the three different locations. So this case here, they show that some work needs to be done in the, in the, to make sure that we have some good data to enter into the model that we, we use. The other thing about the uh, processing of uh, automotive fiber placement using thermoplastic composite is the low interlaminar strength. Now there has been a lot of work done and people have measured the interlaminar strength for the uh, thermoplastic composite that they come and pick uh, using AFB. And the value they, they obtain is between, very between say 35 to 50. MPA. Now you do that for the other player, you get 80. So there is a big difference between the, uh, the, uh, the interlaminar shear strength for the case of AFB and also other player. And there are many reasons for these low value. The reason, one reason for that is because the contact time is too short. It's the same that you have the, the roller and because of the speed of the, uh, the process, the, 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 the time of contact between the layers is very short. And also there is a possibility of deconsolidation. That means that when the roller moves away from the location and whatever the contact you have, it may be deconsolidated due to the spring back of the fibers inside the, inside the, uh, the layers. So uh, recently there has been this uh, paper again from China, Dalian Europe of Technology, and they mentioned that they have a technique that they can address this kind of low value. And the technique they use on the repass technique. The repass technique can be used to improve now, there have been a, a few papers done one country also at the uh, other place as well, and they have done repass. Except in this case, they mentioned one thing that is interesting. In the sense that they mentioned that in order for to improve the properties at the interface, then the temperature there had to be more than melting point. Now, people have not really kind of looked into that particular aspect. Here, they mentioned that the temperature there had to be more than mel the melting point to be beneficial. So they, they show the result. It is saying that what happens here, you have a few layers and they do the repass over the layer. And this is the result. This, these are the temperature at the interface. In one case, it's more than the melting point, another case lower than the melting point and so on. And they show that in terms of varying the temperature at the, melt, uh, at the interface, and you, you compare between this case here for interlaminar shear shrink. For the, for the reference laminate, you have low value. And if you do that at 343 degrees centigrade, you hit this curve at 343, 400, and, uh, and 400 two times. So it's say, uh, they, well, what they mentioned is that you need to have the temperature at the interface more than the melting point to have the benefit of the repass. And so this is the interlaminar shear shrink. And the same thing in terms of the decrease in, the decrease in the porosity, the porosity go down, and also you have the crystallinity goes up if you follow that kind of procedure. So the last kind of issue in terms of uh, automatic fiber placement for thermoplastic composite is renewed distortion of the structure with the free edges. Now there are many different kinds of structures that we can make. You can have a complete cylinder where you don't have the free edge, but you have something like a free edge, like a, like a flat plate like this. This one here is a laminate, it's unidirectional layer, all fibers along one direction. But right after manufacturing, it gets to be distorted, right after manufacturing. So that means that you don't have anything like a unsymmetric laminate or anything like this. So this is an issue in terms of trying to make sample full of the characterization. 
So what we have found that if you use a hot mantle, the hot mantle, you can, you can kind of address this issue. And also the other thing to do is to anneal, to anneal the structure after you, you, you manufacture, you can also uh, get rid of the distortion. So I think this one here uh, summarizes uh, some of the issues concerning the, uh, uh, the, auto, the uh, automotive composite manufacturing for thermoset and thermoplastic composite. I want to take one or two minutes of your time to introduce something that we have started recently at Concordia called the 4D printing of composite for more or less composite manufacturing. The reason I presented here because we also use the AFP to make the laminate. So basically the, uh, the concept is related to 3D printing. In 3D printing at the center, people lay down many layers, except in the case of 4D printing, they vary the material from location to location. So when, when you subject it to some kind of activation process such as heat, electricity, light, and so on. So this flat structure changed to a curved structure. So basically what it says right now, you lay down something on the flat mode and then you activate that and you have a curved structure. And the fourth dimension is a change of the configuration from flat to, to curve. So basically here, what we do is that the 3D printer we use in this case is the automated fiber replacement machine. And the principle behind this is that we use uh, unsymmetric laminate. I think most of the time people in aerospace industry use symmetric laminates, which is good. Uh, except that in the case of 4D printing, we use unsymmetric laminate that is 0, 90. For example, here you have, if you lay it up 90, 0, the, thing, the, the end result there, you have something down in, uh, bending downward, 0, 90, bending upward. At 0, 45, you have bending and twisting. So two quick examples that we have used this kind of technique to make uh, two kinds of structure. One is a wood concordia, the other one is a composite leaf springs. So the wood concordia, basically we're gonna get the letter C-O-N-C-O-R-D-I-A, but using only a flat mode. We don't, we don't wanna use a complex mode. So this one here shows you the layup sequence for the letter A. The letter A here, these are the layer, the layer that you lay down flat. And then by the time you cure it and you cool it, you get the letter A. So finally we have the letter the whole thing here for the different kind of layup sequence. Another uh, structure we made here, that is the case of the composite leaf spring. The composite leaf spring here, you have these kind of springs they use in automobile. And in this case, we want to make it out of composite and also to, uh, to make it using 4D printing. So here, the laminate we use here has 60 layers, 36 layer of 90, 24 layer of 20, uh, zero. And this one, uh, we make that on a flat, uh, flat mode, we have the final shape. In this case, it has the spring constant of 486 newton per centimeter. We subject it to fatigue cycle up and down more than 1 million cycles without any sign of degradation. So finally, in terms of future outlook, uh, in the sense that the, uh, what is to look from here, what I find is that there are people that want to go beyond the scheme. In the sense that they say, when, when, most of the time right now, AFB and things like that, we, we use to make the scheme. But people want to make also the frame, airframe rather than only the scheme. So there is a consortium between a company in the United States called Continuous Composite and uh, Lockheed Martin. And they are trying to do basically that. So basically they want to do is continuous fiber uh, 3D printing. They do 3D printing using continuous fibers. And here what you do is you get the dry fiber spool. You get your wet with some kind of resin system. And from there you uh, make the compaction and you make a snap queer. So this is very important depending on the kind of resin system that they have. And so when, right now they mentioned they are working with the resin system to do that. So hopefully in the future, maybe something like that can be used to make even the airframe. Finally, I want to take the last minute here to introduce you the sixth international symposium on automotive composite manufacturing, ACM6. The ACM5 was held at the National Year Composite Center in Bristol last year. So this one will be held on March 4 to 8, 2024 at the University of South Carolina in Colombia. And for this uh, conference here, there will be keynote speaker from Boeing, NASA, NAIA, Spirit System. March the 4th, there is a tour of the campus and reception at Martin. March the 8th, there is a trip uh, to Charleston and tour of Boeing. And the paper will be featured in the Journal of Manufacturing, uh, Manufacturing Letters. And I thank you for your attention.
Hi, everyone. Um, well, thank you to Professor Michael Wisnam uh, for inviting me. And uh, thank you, Professor Hoa, for a, a really excellent presentation. Uh, actually, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about some of the stuff that you mentioned, too. So uh, hopefully, I will honor what you said. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm Enrique Garcia. I'm the CTO at the National Composite Center in the UK. Uh, we're based in Bristol. Um, and uh, we sit in a really interesting position because we are uh, part of the University of Bristol. And obviously, we collaborate very closely with the Bristol Composites Institute and other uh, University of Bristol Institutes. But we're also part of the Catapult Network. So we're part of the High Valley Manufacturing Catapult together with the, the other centers that you see there. Um, as part of the High Valley Manufacturing Catapult, so we were established uh, by Innovate UK in 2011. Uh, in the case of the High Valley Manufacturing Catapult, we're seven different centers, each one with a specialty, although there are several centers with a pretty significant composites capability. We are the, the lead center uh, being the National Composite Center, but there is significant capability at AMRC, at, at CPI, WMG, and, and NMIS. So overall, uh, we work with uh, companies of all sizes in the UK. 54% uh, of them are SMEs, and uh, we hold quite a lot of uh, equipment uh, and capability around manufacturing, but also all across the field of engineering. In the case of the NCC in particular, we're Europe's leading composite innovation capability center in terms of uh, capability around automated manufacturing. You will see some of the stuff that uh, we already have. and. Um, what we do as a catapult is uh, bridge the valley of debt. So we collaborate really closely with uh, academia, and that's the Bristol Composites Institute, but also all of the other universities in the UK and internationally that work on the development of composite materials. Uh, we also work really closely with industry, but uh, we are not on the fundamental research. We're not on the serial production. What we do is translation uh, of research. So we identify challenges in industry and try to translate that into research lines for, for academia. And also we identify extremely high potential solutions coming out of academia and try to transform those into industrial solutions. So today, uh, rather than focusing a little bit too much on what we do, uh, what I would want to cover is uh, some trends that I have identified in, in automated composite manufacturing. So um, for those of us who have been around for a while, when we talk about automated composite manufacturing, a lot of the times we end up talking about tape laying or fiber placement. And most of the times we're thinking about aerospace applications. But actually, one of the major trends that uh, has happened in the last few years is uh, what, what we call horses for courses, which essentially means that there's quite a lot of like a massive wide variety of, of new manufacturing processes that have been automated. And uh, some of those are actually highly specialized. So I'm going to try to cover some of the, the ones that I consider quite interesting. Uh, another really major trend that uh, was mentioned already by Professor Ho was the, the moving from um, manufactured uh, part inspection, so inspection of the, of the finished parts, uh, and moving into in-process monitoring. And that is specifically true, uh, as shown before in in the presentation for fiber placement, but it's not only the only place uh, where in-process monitoring is being used. And, and that, I mean, allows for extremely rapid identification of quality issues and uh, increased reliability in the manufacturing process. And then there's another step beyond in-process monitoring. Uh, so what uh, we have been trying to develop is uh, moving from uh, iter an iterative process, trial and error kind of, to right first time, which, uh, is most definitely allowed by having a really good understanding of the fundamentals developed by the academics uh, and simulation tools, and then the in-process monitoring to actually capture uh, the data that uh, can fine tune the, the simulation. And then what we are trying to move into is the right every time. So essentially using advanced simulation tools, machine learning, and other AI uh, technologies, uh, everything that we can uh, in, in the toolbox to allow for close, closed loop manufacturing processes. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about each one of those. So one of the things that uh, I mentioned is that uh, right now composites are widely used. And, and the reason for that is that they enable uh, the natural transformation. So there's significantly more variety. So um, 
in 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 a work that uh, we did together with the composites uk and and the composite leadership forum here in the uk it was identified that composites can play a significant role in in some of the key aspects to deliver net zero and again this transforms into specific needs in different sectors and this is one of the reasons why atl and afp are not uh, the only automated manufacturing processes in composites anymore so Automated deposition is still one of the key aspects, uh, and that's quite clear. And what I'm what I'm trying to show here is uh, traditional uh, or uh, manufacturing processes that uh, have been around for for quite a while. Some of those are available at the NCC, some are not. But uh, yeah, you can see an electro impact robot uh, with uh, fiber placement and tape laying capability. A Coriolis uh, robot again country based uh, ATL and AFP, through thickness reinforcement, reforming, tailor fiber placement, all of those have been around for a while. Braiding, uh, that uh, again, we have at the NCC, uh, things like 3D weaving for extremely complex and uh, uh, very elaborate uh, laminates like the ones that uh, are shown there from Albany. There's also quite a lot of move around press-based uh, automated composite uh, processes, so not necessarily on the deposition, but more on the application of the of the resin. So, SMC, BMC, um, injection over molding, like shown there by um, apart from CCP Grandson uh, in the UK. So those are processes that uh, have been around and are evolving constantly. Um, Something that uh, we have been developing uh, together with uh, a company in the UK called Loop Technology is ultra high rate deposition. So the idea here is that we can deposit um, very uh, highly in a very highly controlled manner. We can deposit non-cream fabric. So we're not talking about uh, tapes anymore. We're talking about full laminates in one go. And uh, what we think we can achieve, and we have achieved uh, in a collaboration with Airbus in, in the Wing of Tomorrow program, are rates that are probably well, seven to 10 times higher than anything that we have seen uh, using tape laying or fiber placement. The, the thing that you can see in the lower part is uh, pick and place. So on top of the rolling and unrolling that uh, we can do with the ultra high rate deposition, that you can see on the top two pictures, we can also do patches, like pretty big patches. Uh, so capturing in flat or picking in flat and then forming and depositing in 3D directly on the tool. Additive manufacturing was already mentioned by Professor Hoa. Um, there's quite a lot going on. So on the one hand, there's quite a lot of applications for mainly for tooling uh, when it comes to short fiber polymers or short fiber reinforced polymers. So just a few uh, of the options. So the Lincoln Electric obviously is, is INVAR, but I thought that it was interesting in terms of uh, how do you automate the manufacturing of tooling anyway, um, metallic tooling in this case. The rest are uh, short fiber reinforced polymers. This is not by any means a comprehensive list. So apologies for the people that were not included already, uh, but, but there's quite a lot of movement around that. And probably more interesting, and also as mentioned by Professor Hoa, is uh, other options like continuous fiber uh, manufacturing. And there's quite a lot of companies actually working working on this. So we have some of the more traditional uh, equipment suppliers like Ingersoll, for example. But we, what we also have is a, a number of uh, newcomers that are actually proposing things that are really interesting. Professor Hoa mentioned continuous composites. But they're not the only ones. Uh, so Mark Forge were probably the, the first name that came uh, uh, to the public eye, let's say, in terms of continuous fiber. But 90 Labs are doing very interesting stuff uh, in terms of consolidating composites and combining short fiber with continuous fiber. Mantis Composites, again, doing really interesting stuff around uh, thermoplastics, high-end thermoplastics, but also ceramics. Arivo uh, managed to get quite a lot of publicity. and. SIAD is also uh, really well known and, and delivering quite a lot. Uh, on top of this, uh, or in addition to this, there's also quite a lot of uh, really interesting, maybe smaller niche programs or, or processes, but uh, that combined with the more traditional uh, ATL, AFP, uh, and some of the other uh, technologies, we think that have a, a lot of potential. And again, this is not a comprehensive list by any means, but uh, 
some of the really interesting ones that we have identified, for example, are the the kitting um, technologies uh, developed by Airborne uh, that are going to be used in aerospace really soon. Uh, things like impossible objects and, and arrays uh, with the additive molding. Um, FIPS, we think, is pushing the boundaries a little bit with the, with the slalom technology. So it's not necessarily AFP. It, uh, it's something slightly different with, that we think has quite a lot of potential. Electro impact uh, also doing the combination of, uh, let's say, polymer 3D printing and then laminating with AFP on top. Uh, the work that Signet and Manchester have done around multi-axial winding, for example, is, we think, extremely interesting. Cibotec and the patch placement, uh, which has quite a lot of potential for hydrogen, we think, but also for quite complex geometries uh, with pretty interesting uh, mechanical properties. For surface generation, for example, in terms of uh, what they're doing around very controlled uh, uh, heating and cooling uh, in a pixelated way. So you can actually have extremely different uh, temperature controls during the curing of, of, the, of the processes. And, and obviously, uh, last but not least, Ecomat, uh, which was uh, it's a startup from the University of Bristol. We collaborated with them really closely. We're pretty proud of what they have achieved. So they overcome some of the limitations that were mentioned by Professor Hoa on, on steering by doing continuous shearing instead of uh, of uh, steering. So what you can see there is a, a laminate with no wrinkles and very quite extreme uh, shearing. Again, most of them are relatively niche, but uh, when combined in the right way and uh, when really understanding what can be done around design for manufacturing for the specific solution, we think that they have quite a lot of potential. So one of the really important things to, to mention, or at least for us, uh, is to really understand that uh, automated manufacturing does not work in isolation. So I mentioned before design for manufacturing, that's quite a critical bit for us. So every single time that we approach a new automated manufacturing process, uh, well, we think about all of the stuff that is there. So it's a combination of the design and simulation capabilities that come before the manufacturing. So having a deep understanding uh, based on the knowledge that is developed at the, at the universities is extremely critical for us. Then is the manufacturing itself and doing the trials and uh, again, trying to get as much as possible to write first time and write every time that I will talk about later. And then all of the validation and the NDT inspection so that we can actually correlate some of the models and really fine tune. So as I mentioned before, one of the other trends that uh, I have seen or that we have identified is the move from part inspection, so finished part inspection, to in-process monitoring. Uh, and then to really understand how that can translate into maximizing the performance, not of the, the as-designed performance, but the as-manufactured performance, so really understanding the effect of defects. So on, on the first line, what you see is, let's say, traditional NDT technologies for finished parts. Uh, well, actually, some of them are uh, actually destructive, like uh, computer tomography. But what you have is ultrasonic, serography, uh, thermography, CT. All of those are for finished parts. But actually, you can get significantly more useful information or, or com combine that, in, that, that useful information with really useful in-process monitoring information. So things around the position, for example, uh, in fiber placement, there's a lot of work around laser triangulation, as mentioned by Professor Hoa. But actually, uh, in Canada, the NRC developed a, a really interesting technology around optical coherence tomography, and uh, this has been implemented by FIPS. And we think that this definitely have quite a lot of potential. As as mentioned in the previous uh, one of the challenge in the previous presentation, one of the challenges is actually handling the vast amount of data that uh, you generate, but with high power computing and uh, more and more with uh, additive, uh, sorry, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, I think that identifying trends and really understanding how you can fully optimize for that will be quite important. Uh, on top of the deposition, the there's also in-process monitoring that uh, could be implement can be implemented in 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 tools. So what, what I'm showing there is a, is a sensor that can be fully embedded into into a tool. It's not necessarily new, but it's a trend that we're seeing more and more and uh, 
not it's, it's not only a trend it's something that uh, is becoming more and more apparent that is extremely useful so the next step to that is actually what i mentioned around moving from right first time or as close to right first time as possible to write every time so what i'm giving next is an example on on a, a very simple part so what you can see down uh, right in the center is basically a part inside a tool it's a part that contains a significant uh, change in 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 thickness and that implies several drop-offs so there's quite a lot of parameters that can affect that uh, and it's an rtm uh, component so it's basically deposited uh, in this case it was deposited um, manually and then there's a, an, an infusion process uh, with with an rtm so there's quite a lot of parameters that can vary so the the more traditional approach uh, would be the output focused on the quality control so basically you go through the whole process you finish the part you cure the part and then you inspect it the next step on top of that uh, would be to work on two things so on the one hand is the in process inspection that i mentioned before so embedding sensors in the tool and that allows you to to just identify when the full front uh, is moving uh, in parallel to that you can develop uh, offline predictive uh, simulations so basically it's the manufacturing process simulation that you can see on on the right so in this case we develop high fidelity simulations um, that allowed us to really identify all of the different parameters that can go wrong and what you what i'm showing there is three different options uh, that the, the main difference between the three is basically very slight variations or where a couple of layers are positioned and you can see the difference uh, the, the effect of of these variations in in how the part is is filling up um, so one of the things that you can do with the combination of the online predictive and the in-process inspection is to have a correlation of the simulation and some level of statistical process control. So this would allow to get as close as possible to write first time as fast as possible. But we think we can go one step beyond, which is what I'm trying to show here. So the next level uh, on top of this is rather than having in-process inspection alone, what we want to do is to have in-process predictive. So because we had a well-correlated high fidelity simulation, we could generate and we generated with a high performance computing uh, working together with CFMS, which is also in Bristol and with the University of Bristol, we generated 15,000 simulations varying all of the parameters that we considered uh, important. And with that, we managed to construct a surrogate model. So this allows us to predict what is going on. Because we have sensors, we can actually, during uh, an infusion, we can identify which one of the 15,000 simulations is the closest that represents what is happening on the real infusion. And then we can use machine learning to build an adaptive model so that we can identify what is going on. We can know if the, the infusion is going to be successful or not, and also determine what the right course of action is to correct the infusion in case it is not working well. So essentially what we have done is to move from inspection of the part that has already been manufactured to have real in-process control, which allows us to, again, reach right every time, not right first time, right every time. So this is a very simple example, uh, but actually it's a very powerful one. And this framework can be applicable to any automated process uh, as far as it allows to just have high fidelity simulations and uh, well, the speed of the process allows for corrections. So again, quick summary, uh, three major trends that uh, I think are quite evident, uh, especially in the last few years and that I think will actually continue is the, 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 the expansion of the composite world in terms of automated composite manufacturing processes. It's not only limited to two or three. Now we have quite a, a really wide array of portfolio 
of, of automated manufacturing processes. In-process monitoring is becoming more and more important, and there is already a step beyond in-process monitoring, which is the right every time. So I hope you enjoyed the, the, the talk, and uh, I will stop sharing, and I think it's the turn for uh, questions. So, BJ asking I can't hear you very well, Michael. I cannot hear you either. Sound is really choppy. Apologies for that. The question is No. Uh, it's sort of a big question in the chat. If you would both like to go through the questions that are in the Q&A, I can read them out for you if you'd like. Yeah, I can hear Megan very well. Yeah. Would you like me to read the questions out? Yeah, I think there's a, a question for Professor Hua, the okay. first one. Uh, Someone's asked, is it interesting to see the 4D printed structures, which are quite large in size? What is the type of stimuli for the shape transformation? Could you please elaborate? Yes, the uh, 4D printing that we did uh, use is uh, to use the regular kind of uh, pre that uh, like a carbon epoxy that we have. And then uh, you lay the pre break down flat, and then you put that inside the, either the oven or the other glue. And then you clear it and you cool it and uh, and you have the shape. So the stimulus here is the uh, the cooling from the clear temperature down to the room temperature. So I mean you you follow the, the same process like uh, you would clear the uh, composite like you know you have made the composite uh, more, you know more, for many years. So basically the uh, stimulus here is the cooling I mean the interaction between the layer. You have the zero degree, they have the ninety degree. And you have the difference in the coefficient of thermal contraction between the two layers. So by the time you cool it from, uh, say, uh, 180 degrees centigrade down to room temperature, so the difference in the temperature there and the difference in the coefficient of thermal, thermal expansion create the shape change. I'm just gonna join on. It's the same process like like we people have done before. Hello. So I'm back in. Very yeah, good. We can, we can, you know. Okay, so a question here from uh, Yunxin Gao. From the winding processes, how to determine the winding tension of the fibers? So I don't know who would like to take that. We haven't had a, a, a lot about filament winding. Would, would either of you like to take that question? I'm, I'm not really sure what the question is about. How do you measure? Determine the, the, the tension. winding tension of the fibers. Maybe there's a little bit of a specific question. Uh, if, if you have, either of you'd like to make a comment or else we'll perhaps move on to the, the yeah. winding tension in the fiber. So normally you have some kind of a control, right? Some kind of device to control the tension of the fiber during the process. Yeah. 
so some kind of a friction device or something, you control the tension of the fiber. And you probably can put in some kind of a gauge there along the line to measure the tension. Yep. Okay, let's, let's move on. A question here from Edward Wang. When we talk about the right first time, right every time, how to define the word right? Does that mean there are lots of mechanical tests of the part needed to set the right number? That's a really good question. So right is uh, according to spec. Uh, I would say so. I mean, a lot of the time we have discussions with some of the customers uh, around is this the right spec? But uh, basically, for us, uh, manufacturing a right part is basically just making sure that it's within spec. And that means tolerances, uh, dimensional tolerances, but also performance wise, it needs to perform basically. So, yes, there are mechanical tests associated to just making sure that the part is right. But uh, a lot of the times it's both mechanical and, and uh, dimensional tolerances. I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. A question from Sayata here for Enrique. Yep. What kind of fidelity accuracy are you getting with the machine learning approach for RTM? What was the volume okay. of data used to create the model? Did you use a simulation software initially like PAM RTM or LIMS? Yeah, that, that's really good questions, all of them. So yes, we did LIMS, uh, we did use LIMS. So we collaborated with uh, Suresh, uh, Advani and, and the team, uh, basically to just make sure that we can parallelize uh, the, the simulation so that we could use the high performance computer. Um, we actually generated 15,000 simulations because uh, I mean, to correlate the, the, to initially correlate the high, high fidelity model, we run a, a, a set of tests, uh, not too many, around 20 or so, but uh, the correlation was good enough so that we can, we decided that we could trust the, the, the model uh, to actually build the 15,000 simulations with all the variations. So slightly short, uh, slightly too short laminates and uh, slightly higher temperature, slightly lower temperature, all of that. Um, but we decided that we needed the 15,000 simulations to really make sure that uh, we could uh, generate the, the, the model, uh, the surrogate model, and that is what we used then for, for the machine learning. It was quite accurate. I'm surprisingly accurate, I mean, considering all of this. Uh, so uh, the overall success was around, or, or the overall um, uh, accuracy that, that we managed to get was around 90 94% if I remember correctly. So out of the 15,000 simulations, we used uh, a number of them to train the machine learning. And then the rest were basically to capture the, the accuracy. And it was around, yeah, 93, 94%. Of course, it's a very simple part. I mean, just bear in mind that it was uh, kind of like 2D, if you will. So there, there was a significant decrease in thickness, but it, it's not double curvature or anything like that. But uh, ever since we we have moved uh, some, I mean the the same framework, let the, the same philosophy. Let's say we have moved in, into other um, manufacturing processes, and and again the, the framework is it is not the super final answer, but uh, I think it gets us significantly closer to the closed loop. Okay, thank you. Uh, perhaps we have time to to one one more question. Um, this is an anonymous question. Is it possible to use 4D printing concept for complex structures? If so, how can you make it uh, complex in the, the sense of doubly curved surfaces? Uh, well, so far, the, um, we have made some structure that can assist uh, of uh, changing from uh, convex to concave. So I mean, if it's the inflection point, like we, we made uh, like a stiffener for aircraft. And also recently we made a cone, the cone cone shell using the 4D printing method. And now if you um, you want to know how to, uh, to make it, I will give a presentation at ICCM at the end of the month uh, about that. So, <laughs> but this case here, and uh, the, the doubly curved surface, uh, we have not done, uh, we, we have done single, uh, single curvature, a taper like the case of the cone, and also, uh, like I said, the chain from uh, convex to concave as well. We have not tried out the double curve, curve surface. We need to find some kind of a structure that can, can may do that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. We have run out of time. So with that, I would really like to draw this to a close and thank our two speakers for, for really stimulating uh, presentations and really the excitement of what, what, what we can see coming along in the future of automated composites manufacturers. So thank you very much. The, the video and the presentations will be made available on the composites 
Bristol Commons Institute website. And there you can also see previous talks we've had in this series, and we will be running some more in the future. So thank you to Enrique and Song for your talks, and thank you all for attending. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, for listening. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.